Why is there a high rate of homelessness in the LGBTQ2S plus community? Absolutely. So I think it can really boil down to homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia. So we know that LGBTQ2S plus young people are dramatically overrepresented among young people experiencing homelessness. This is often the result of parents rejecting a young person's sexual and or gender identity, which I, I really think is, you know, is the result of ingrained homophobia, biphobia, and or transphobia in the parent. So really thinking about the structural issues um, again. And then we need to think about what happens when LGBTQ2S uh, plus young people become homeless too. So there are often few services available to them that are specific to the LGBTQ, LGBTQ2S plus community. This can lead LGBTQ2S plus young people to avoid this shelter system um, as a whole, which may lead them to sleeping rough, which can further their experience um, or risk of experiencing violence while on the street. And we know that the shelter system itself can be homophobic, biphobic, and transphobic. And this is coming from other residents as well as staff too, right? So we know that a lot of um, emergency shelters have ties to religious institutions. And we know a lot of religious institutions um, denounce or, you know, they don't um, accept the LGBTQ2S plus um, community. So I think, you know, there's a lot of factors associated with that right there. And, you know, we often speak about youth, but we don't know as much about LGBTQ2S plus adults and seniors. So we're just starting to see some figures from point in time counts on the proportion of LGBTQ2S plus individuals um, among people experiencing homelessness, uh, among adults and seniors experiencing homelessness, but it's kind of still too early to make any strong conclusions. We also don't see sexual orientation as much being used as a variable or people aren't asking about it in research studies as well, you know, and even when gender or, or you know, um, gender is um, posed as a question, it can still be in those binaries, right, of, of either women or man. So I think, you know, it's important to really for researchers to really extend that there's some really good uh, resources out there that really, you know, can help researchers to really de um, define different categories of gender, um, similarly with sexual orientation, because if we don't ask these questions, we don't know, right? So I think there's a lot of uh, research gaps attached to that. But what we do know about LGBTQ2S plus adults and seniors, um, trans, Transgender and non-binary communities, particularly racialized transgender and non-binary communities, um, experience transphobia and racism from landlords and employers, which limits their ability, you know, to find housing and employment. So there's a lot of, you know, we hear, I forget the rates of homelessness among individuals who are um, transgender, but I think, you know, they're much higher than the general population as well. We also know that, you know, adults and seniors also require specific services. They might want to see LGBTQ2S plus staff um, at emergency, emergency shelters, at housing programs. They may want to see a housing, like a, a building dedicated to LGBTQ2S plus adults and seniors. So, you know, I think going back to the sense of community piece too, really building community among other LGBTQ2S plus adults and seniors who have experienced homelessness is something that you know, is not often considered in general service delivery and is, I think, is a huge gap um, for services kind of, you know, across the age spectrum, but particularly for um, LGBTQ2S plus adults and seniors. I'm wondering about that sort of research gap in, in asking about sexual orientation. Do you think that that is sort of intentional that people aren't asking because they're uncomfortable asking or they don't want to make people uncomfortable? Or do you think that that's a bit of a blind spot in research where we're just not recognizing the importance of asking the question? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's probably a bit of both. You know, I think, you know, we fear, we want to respect an individual's privacy and, you know, choice to feel comfortable to, to come out or not uh, with, you know, one's um, sexual orientation or gender identity. So. I think, you know, even ethics boards sometimes, I think may push back on like, why do you need to ask that question? But I think 
to the to the other point, we, we need to we need to ask it or we won't know, right? We're gonna um, you know, it causes erasure to a certain degree if we don't ask that question. So I, you know, respect people who feel that, you know, that this isn't um, salient to the issue of homelessness, but I think it's really, you know, a missed opportunity to think about, you know, we have this overrepresentation of LGBTQ2S plus young people. We need to do something about it, right? If we didn't ask, we wouldn't know that number and we wouldn't have kind of tailored services that are being developed. And I do think it is something that researchers may forget to ask because it, it isn't always reported. They may not be seeing it in other literature. So, you know, if, if they're using a protocol from another study where sexual orientation wasn't included, then I think, you know, they may think, oh, I, I don't need to include it myself, or I guess maybe this isn't a salient variable. So yeah, it, it I think we're getting to a place where it's less of a stigmatized kind of question because there's more openness, um, there's more, you know, less fear of coming out to a certain degree um, in, in some cases. So yeah, it is a tricky question though. It is. 